Today, the January 6th committee heard one from one of Trump's closest White House aides. Stephen Miller, a former senior advisor in the Trump White House, testified virtually before the committee for eight and a half hours. Just the latest high-profile member of the Trump administration to appear before the committee. Yesterday, the two top lawyers in the Trump White House, Pat Cipollone of the former White House counsel and Patrick Philbin, who was Cipollone's deputy, met separately with the panel. In recent weeks, the former president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, and her husband, Jared Kushner, sat for a combined 15 hours of questioning. Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland serves on the January 6th committee, and he joins me now. It's striking at the end of that list, Congressman, that in the end, uh, uh, it, it seems that a lot of people very close to the president have cooperated with the committee and given testimony. Well, nobody wants to get left behind because the truth is coming out um, in the way it's supposed to in a democracy. And um, it's kind of the way you journalists operate. You say, well, we're going to have everybody yes. else speaking to us, but not you unless you decide to come forward. And so that seems like to be a wood, for it's like a woodwork book. For those in. <laughs> exactly. Uh, nobody wants to get uh, left left on the dock, you know. Um, but uh, look, the truth is the whole country now knows the basic outlines of the story. We don't know exactly what every single person was doing at every moment. Uh, but we know that there was uh, one line of attack, which was a violent insurrection, unprecedented in our history, which ended up uh, injuring, wounding, hospitalizing more than 150 of our police officers and interrupting the peaceful transfer of power for the first time in American history as they shut down the counting of electoral college votes. And then another line uh, of attack, which was the coup, or what the political scientists call a self-coup, where uh, it's not the military going against the president, it's the president trying to overturn the constitutional process and the mm. results of an election. And that's precisely what happened there. And we are just putting the pieces together on all of the different actions and how these two different plots were coordinated. You know, obviously your committee doesn't have criminal jurisdiction. This is a, a, a function, a legislative body that has been uh, impaneled for this purpose. Y y you did say this, um, we have not been shy about criminal evidence we encounter and our report will profuse, be profuse in setting forth crimes that have not yet been alleged. How do you think about your role, the Department of Justice's role, and, and, and how to write about or lay out evidence if you feel that you have found evidence of crimes. Well, yeah, I don't understand this, you know, recent media controversy around purported conflicts within uh, the, our committee about whether or not to make criminal referrals. We've not been reticent in any way at all about setting forth what we know. When uh, Judge Carter in the Eastman litigation, um, which dealt with Eastman's attempt to get Chapman University not to turn over mm -hmm. the call records we were looking for, um, when he asked the question of whether or not uh, Eastman's claim of attorney-client privilege could be defeated by uh, the crime fraud exception. We briefed that out and we set forth uh, a number of potential federal criminal statutory offenses that we thought would dilute uh, or negate any uh, claim of attorney-client privilege. And Judge Carter basically followed us in that. And he said it was more likely than not that... Um, that Donald Trump had engaged in federal crimes in trying to interfere with the federal uh, proceeding and uh, conspiring to defraud the American people of an honest election. So the, he set that forth. And so we're going to lay out everything that we see. But we also want people to understand this is not just like an Agatha Christie novel here. I mean, we know who done it. Um, it's a question of going forward. How are we going to fortify ourselves and fortify democratic institutions and processes against coups and insurrections well, and subversion in the future. This is a, maybe a strange question, but it's a narrative one uh, and, and one that I have some expertise in, which is when you say it's not Agatha Christie, right, why does a mystery novel exist? Well, it exists because you want to find out who done it, right? And the thing that pulls you through the book is precisely the suspense of that. In this case, again, there isn't suspense about who did it. We know who did. So then the question becomes from the sort of attention standpoint or the storytelling standpoint, how you communicate and capture the public's attention about that story. Well, uh, there are lots of characters who are not known to the broad public today who were involved in this. There were a number of heroes 
who surface throughout this process, hmm. and we want to make sure we're profiling them as well as the villains uh, of this story. But it's very important to know how it was done as well as who done it, and uh, that's what uh, citizens in the world's greatest multiracial, multireligious, multicultural constitutional democracy need to know. What are the weaknesses mm -hmm. that these reactionary alt-right neo-fascist forces uh, conspired to take advantage of? Because they did, and it will be, I think, both agonizing and riveting for the country to see how close we came to losing it all. It's certainly as close to fascism as I ever want to come in my life, and we need people to understand what the weaknesses were and then how we're going to uh, seal up uh, the weaknesses so we can move forward in democracy to deal with the pressing issues of our time, like climate change, which is bearing down on everybody. Well, in my business, we call that a good tease. So I'm, I'm, you, you have me, uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.